What would you do if you were an anesthesiologist in the middle of an uneventful surgery and you notice something strange? Some smoke is coming from under the drapes and on further inspection you realize your patient's mouth is actually on fire. My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And in this video, we are gonna be talking about what happens during an airway fire and what exactly an anesthesiologist should do about it. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. Believe it or not, this is actually not just sensationalism or clickbait, but airway fires are an actual issue that not only come up in anesthesiology training and is tested on our board exams, but actually happens an estimated 50 to 200 times per year in the United States. So it's really important for anesthesiologists to be aware of exactly what they can do to recognize and address airway fires and also be aware of all of the prevention strategies that exist to make sure that they just don't happen in the first place. Airway fires can happen when there's the perfect unfortunate combination of three components, which are an ignition source, for example, electrocautery like a bovi that's commonly used by surgeons. Second is a fuel source, which is anything that will just continue to burn. And believe it or not, there are a lot of different fuel sources in an operating room, including many different types of endotracheal tubes, as well as things like the surgical drapes. And the third component that's necessary for an airway fire is an oxidizer. And guess what oxidizer is plentiful in an operating room? Oxygen. For the anesthesiology trainees who are watching this video, be prepared for those three components to come up on your board exams throughout your training. If an airway fire does occur, the very first things that need to happen are the surgery needs to stop immediately, the amount of oxygen that the patient's receiving needs to be turned down as much as possible, and then if an endotracheal tube is in place, that actually needs to be taken out right away. The reason why we turn down the oxygen concentration and then remove the endotracheal tube is because if the endotracheal tube is indeed on fire and we pull it out of the patient with 100% oxygen blasting through the tube, then it basically just becomes a flamethrower. So we need to make sure to turn down the amount of oxygen that's going through the endotracheal tube before we pull it out in the event of a fire. As counterintuitive as it sounds to remove an endotracheal tube from a patient who's under general anesthesia, the reason we do that in the event of an airway fire is to reduce the likelihood that that tube actually melts into the patient's airway and causes further damage. And keep in mind that because an endotracheal tube can actually be a fuel source for a fire, we want to remove that fuel source from the patient so it doesn't cause harm inside of their airway. Once the endotracheal tube has been removed, the next thing that needs to happen is the fire needs to be extinguished. And the best way to do that in the operating room on short notice is using any sort of saline or water-based solution that's obviously not flammable. The surgeon should actually already have saline available on the field if they're working in a situation with a slightly elevated risk of an airway fire. But alternatively, there's another source of something that's pretty close to saline that we can access very easily on the anesthesiologist side of the drapes. In a dire situation, you can actually just reach for the bag of lactated ringers or isolite or whatever you happen to have right next to you and open that bag up right onto the fire to try to extinguish it. And if that doesn't work, there should be a carbon dioxide based fire extinguisher available to put out the fire. If an airway fire has occurred, then it's reasonable to consider using bronchoscopy to evaluate the patient's airway for any sort of damage or residual portions of the endotracheal tube that may have burnt off while the fire was happening. Of course, this should only be done once the fire has been extinguished and ventilation has safely been reestablished. Once the fire has been extinguished, the next step is to reestablish ventilation, which is preferably done with something like a self-inflating resuscitation bag. One aspect of anesthesiology that I commonly tell people is that a lot of my job entails anticipating, preventing, and trying to think about how I would address any sort of very rare but life-threatening event that could happen in or around the operating room. To that end, prevention strategies are a routine part of anesthesia practice to ensure that we just don't end up with an airway fire in the first place. Thinking back to the three components that are necessary for an airway fire to occur, namely an ignition source, an oxidizer, and a fuel source, 
we can think about trying to reduce the presence of each one of those. It's worth pointing out that there are multiple different types of ignition sources that surgeons can use, including electrocautery like bovies or lasers. And in the particular case of lasers, there are specially designed reinforced endotracheal tubes that are recommended to reduce the risk of a fire. What's more, when a surgeon is using a laser and the anesthesiologist uses a laser-resistant endotracheal tube, the cuff on the tube should actually not be filled with air, but rather with saline and methylene blue, so that in the event that the cuff pops, then methylene blue is sprayed all over the place, and it's immediately evident that there was a puncture to the endotracheal tube. As far as an oxidizer is concerned, when there is surgery that's happening near a patient's mouth, we can actually just try to turn down the amount of oxygen that the patient breathes in. This is called the fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2. The trade-off, of course, is that reducing the amount of oxygen that's delivered to a patient might not necessarily be tolerated and does decrease the amount of reserve that a patient has in the event that we're not able to continue delivering oxygen to the patient for a period of time. For example, if the endotracheal tube becomes kinked or disconnected. In my own practice, I try to get the fraction of inspired oxygen down to about 25%, assuming the patient will tolerate it, when there's surgery that's taking place near the patient's mouth. Another oxidizer that comes up routinely in anesthesia practice is the gas nitrous. So it's important to make sure that you avoid nitrous if possible when there's a higher risk of an airway fire, as this can serve as an oxidizer, just like oxygen. Another fuel source that's often present during procedures that take place in a patient's mouth are lap pads that are placed in the patient's mouth. And to that end, we can ask the surgeons to make those lap pads damp or moist using saline on the field before they place it in the patient's mouth. That way, there's not a dry lap pad in the patient's mouth that would be more flammable than a damp lap pad. And generally speaking, for any type of surgery that occurs near a patient's mouth, it's important to make sure that there's a bucket of saline readily available on the surgical field in the event that a fire breaks out. All of this comes down to making sure there's good communication between anesthesiologists and surgeons so that everyone understands what prevention mechanisms are in place and what exactly would be done in the event that a fire were to occur. And the other part of prevention that's worth mentioning is making sure that you know where a fire extinguisher is located relative to your operating room. There should be one close by, if not in the operating room itself. If you enjoyed this video, check out this video that I made explaining how anesthesiologists are trained to deal with situations like this one that are incredibly rare. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.